Welcome back to the 208 on this Labor Day, a day dedicated to the social and economic achievements of the American worker. Our next door neighbor, Oregon, was actually the first state in the union to pass a law recognizing Labor Day. That was in 1887. Four more states followed suit that year. By 1894, 23 more states had adopted the holiday. And on June 28, 1894, Congress passed an act making the first Monday in September a legal holiday. Happy Labor Day. But at the same time when America was beginning to formally celebrate the worker, Idaho was in the middle of a labor uprising in North Idaho. Between 1892 and 1902, Idaho experienced some of its most violent labor struggles in its history. And we were in the middle of an economic recession. They referred to it as the insurrection in Shoshone County. Brian has a look back. The state of Idaho wasn't necessarily known for its labor disputes, but this is most definitely the biggest one. And it had to do with Idaho's biggest and oldest industry. Some of the earliest organized labor efforts started in Oahe County in the 1860s, um, and we had some work in that era leading up to 1890 in railroads, timber, but mining was really the specific industry that organized labor emerged. Between 1863 and 1866, Idaho produced as much as 19% of the U.S. gold. By the 1880s, the mining of metal concentrated in the Coeur d'Alene region, with lead silver yields totaling $4 million by 1890. Labor unions, already in place, were about to be tested. They had helped establish a uniform pay rate of $3.50 for a 10-hour workday. But by March of 1892, the railroads had raised their rates to haul product. So mine owners decided they were gonna lower the rate for some workers by 50 cents a day. And the miners said what? The miners were not happy with this. You know, there had been efforts to organize leading up to 1892 in this particular mining district. And so in the spring of that year, several union mine workers commandeered a train in Jim, Idaho. They took that train to Wardner. And basically a shootout occurred uh, and this shootout ultimately led to a disaster at the Frisco Mill in Wardner. Forcing Governor N.B. Wiley to declare martial law, while the organizers of the train heist were brought to Boise to await trial. And while they were awaiting trial, many of them ended up formulating ideas to create kind of an even larger union, and that was the Western Federation of Miners. And they ended up developing a chapter in the Shoshone district, and it ended up being one of the largest unions in the Coeur d'Alene Shoshone County area. Meanwhile, operations returned to somewhat normal up north, and mine owners continued to curtail organized labor efforts for pay and protections, even after the populist pro-labor candidate Frank Stunerberg was elected governor in 1896. But by the end of the decade, even he had had enough. And so by 1899, there is again another instance of violence that erupted in this region. And this is really what brought in more, I guess you could say, of a, of a hard-fisted suppression. The Bunker Hill and Sullivan mine owners wouldn't pay a union wage, so the union miners decided to undermine the mine's production by blowing up one of their major pieces of equipment. So they packed it with dynamite and they caused utter devastation. People died in this instance as well. And in the aftermath of this particular bout of violence, Governor Studenberg felt that he kind of had to follow the path that Governor Wiley had taken, and he also declared martial law. And being smack in the middle of the Spanish-American War, Idaho's National Guard troops were not available to respond. So that is why Governor Studenberg had to reach out to President McKinley and bring in federal troops to help calm these labor disputes. This martial law lasted until 1901. The ripple effect, a little longer. You know, if you want to kind of look long-term about what the impacts of this particular labor dispute were, you end up with Governor Frank Studenberg um, being assassinated in 1905. To this day, Idaho remains a right-to-work state. So other than the destruction and the death, one could argue this labor dispute didn't leave much of a lasting impression. From the research that I've done on this topic, it seems as though it, it just faded and that this was a, a decade of labor disputes and a decade that was characterized by violence. But it doesn't seem to have had the same kind of lasting impact that other 
work from that same era seems to have had, such as the efforts of suffragists in the state. I had no idea that history. In 1907, Governor Frank Gooding declared Labor Day a state holiday in Idaho. Governor Stunenberg was killed in 1905, as Brian mentioned, four years after leaving office. Get this, by a bomb that was rigged to his gate at his home in Caldwell. Albert Horsley, or Henry Orchard, as he was known to most, was the only one found guilty of Governor Stunenberg's death in 1908. He died at the age of 88 in 1954 at the Idaho State Pen. Well, you saw from that piece how important mining was to Idaho. It still is. It is arguably our first industry. But today, mining employs only about 2,600 Idahoans. We have a lot more choices when it comes to the work we do to make our living. Today, there are roughly 730,000 different kinds of jobs in Idaho. Sure, there are lots of jobs in Idaho, but when it comes to the most abundant, fastest growing, highest paid jobs, Idaho's Labor Department says these professions make the top five list. Software developers, lawyers, management analysts, accountants and auditors, followed by civil engineers. If you want one of the highest paying jobs in Idaho, you need to work as a surgeon. Their average mean salary is about $250,000. Family medicine physicians, dentists, pediatricians, and general internal medicine physicians round out the top five highest paid jobs in Idaho. The lowest paid jobs, a parking attendant making about $19,000 a year, fast food cooks, dishwashers, dining room and cafeteria attendants and bartender helpers, followed by lifeguards, ski patrol and other recreational protective service workers. Did today, here's one more Labor Day list that I thought you'd find pretty interesting. A look at a few of the random professions from the 20th century that no longer exist because of today's technologies. We don't need them. Here's one of them, a switchboard operator. Remember, you couldn't make a call back in the old days without someone manually plugging you into the call. I say remember, but I'm not that old, folks. I don't remember this. These, do these days, though, we don't even hardly call each other. We just mostly text. Here's another job we don't need anymore, thanks to technology, a pin setter. Can you imagine having to wait for a pin setter to manually clear and replace the bowling pins and to wait for them to bring your ball back to you? And who needs a video store clerk when you have Netflix? There is one Blockbuster store still standing, and that's in Bend, Oregon. So I guess the video store clerk isn't totally obsolete. There are still a couple in Bend. Other 20th century jobs that have disappeared, an elevator operator, a knocker upper. Have you ever heard of that one? Before the days of alarm clocks, apparently you could pay someone to wake you up by knocking on your door or your window. That's why they called them knocker. What did they call them? Knocker uppers? <laughs> Knocker uppers. A lamp lighter, we don't need them anymore. We just flip the switch. And a gas station attendant, although again, they still have those in Oregon too.